so I was, I was thinking about mothers in the Bible, and I thought of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and I thought, well, wh what an appropriate uh, topic for consideration today. And uh, so I'd like to dedicate my sharing today to all the, the mothers out there, especially my mom, who's here. So um, I dedicate it to my wife, too, but she's in the other room, mothering all the other children. So, uh, But uh, this is... This is really, I think, something that whether you're a mother or not a mother, we can learn from and that we can gain great insight from the life of this heroic woman, uh, really, really a courageous woman who, uh, was, you know, she persevered and, and she, she has a lot to teach us. So let's begin in Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. As you probably know, most of the material about Mary in the Bible pertains to the time uh, either right before or during or after the birth of Jesus. Uh, because the Gospels, the, the, the point of the Gospels is to focus on Jesus. So we don't really get that much about Mary afterwards. Uh, but we get little snippets here and there. And, and what we do have is really fascinating because Mary uh, is a... She's a three-dimensional person. She's not, she's not just like this uh, stock character and uh, flat on the wall, so to speak. You know, she, she, as I think we'll see, she's very interesting. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, we read, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. All right, so the first thing I want to point out here is that she's betrothed. Uh, we have engagement in our culture. Betrothal was a little different. Here's a statement from Daryl Bach. He writes, the phrase about betrothal refers to the first stage of a two-stage Jewish marriage process. The initial stage of engagement or betrothal involves a formal witnessed agreement to marry and, 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 a financial exchange, now that's, that's a little different than our culture, huh, uh, of the bride price. At this point, the woman legally belongs to the groom and is referred to as his wife. About a year later, the marriage ceremony takes place when the husband takes the wife home. A woman could become betrothed as early as age 12. Luke does not give Mary's age. Uh, we don't really know how old Mary was. At this time, we, we uh, Bible, Bible students, you know, we, 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 we study this, we try to figure it out. We figure she's young because if she wasn't young, she'd already be married. <laughs> That's about all we got. And uh, people in those days w would get married much younger and have children much younger because life expectancy was much shorter. Um, and you, you needed to, you needed to have, have kids. Having kids was, was really big, not just for the Jewish people, but for all ancient peoples because uh, infant mortality rates were high. All, there are all kinds of causes of death. So just to keep the human race going, you had to have kids and lots of kids, preferably. So, and uh, indeed, Mary did have lots of kids, at least seven by my count, uh, maybe more. So she, she, as it turns out, was pretty fertile. But... Um, but anyhow, at this point, she's a virgin, and she's betrothed to Joseph. And, uh, you know, what I think was, was important to notice, too, about this is that it's, it's a formal witnessed agreement, this betrothal, and it's a financial exchange. Betrothals would be hand, handled by the parents. We live in a, a, a liberated society, uh, by some definitions. Uh, other people don't feel like that as much, but anyhow... In their society, the parents would figure things out, and uh, I imagine the kids had some say in the matter. I, I actually went to college with a kid who uh, comes from, I, I don't remember what country, may, maybe India, where, where arranged ma marriages are still the custom. And uh, he had it so easy, guys. You wouldn't believe this. Like, his dad would just bring home a, a, a picture of a girl and say to him, son, do you like? And then if he likes, then... He, he arranges it, and they go out on a date, and, you know, do you still like, or you want to try another one? It was like, I was like, man, we got it so hard here in America. You know, you got to, like, talk to the girl and find common ground. You know, this guy's just like, do you like? And he's showing me all these pictures of all these girls. I'm like, wow, 
I don't know. Sometimes you think uh, your way is the best way until you see some other way. But anyhow, it doesn't matter which way you think is better. This is the way in the time of the Bible in the, in the first century is that uh, these things were typically arranged. So you, you don't think of yourself as an individual so much as part of a group, more of a collectivist mindset where you have your, your immediate family, you have your extended family, you're all living in this village and people know each other. And this thing is, is not a private matter. It's, it's a formal public announcement. People know it. Money has changed hands. There's a contract in our terminology today. And so this thing is going to happen, which sets up the tension for this whole situation uh, very well. One other thing I want to mention about verse 26 here is that we get the word Nazareth. And uh, Nazareth, of course, is a very, very, very famous city. I mean, probably one of the most famous cities in all of history because Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and so Jesus is called a Nazarene, right? Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, it's like his last name. However, before Jesus, Nazareth was pretty much unknown. And uh, we don't have any references to it in the Old Testament. And we do get this one tantalizing little snippet in the Gospel of John where Nathaniel says, and he's from Galilee himself, so he's from the same region, he's from Cana. He says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, they're saying, oh, this Jesus of Nazareth, you know, he's, we think he's the one. And Nathaniel's just like, Nazareth? What a joke. You know, so I mean, it's not, it's not, like, uh, it's not like Jerusalem. It's not some metropolis. It doesn't have all these people and all this history. It's just some podunk town. It's a village. It's a hamlet. It's just, you know, one traffic light, except they didn't have traffic lights. So anyhow... Verse 28, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Just a couple of points here on the greeting. Uh, the, the word greetings here is not the typical word for greeting. It's actually a word for uh, joy. It's, it's uh, an imperative form. It's like saying to somebody, Rejoice. Uh, that's the hello here. So it's, it's, it's an exciting hello. It's not sort of like, how's it going? Or, hi. No, it's like, hello! It's, it's rejoice. And so she's, she's like, wow, this, this angel's really excited. She's pondering it. She's puzzled by it a little bit. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is that you look at verse 28. It says, greetings, O favor one. Okay, and then um, the, other, the other term there in verse 30 it says, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. We have, we have, that's actually the word grace. We have it twice, the word grace. Like she hasn't said or done anything. She's just like standing there still, receiving this greeting. And so uh, the, the first term there in verse, what was that, um, 28, greetings, O favored one. It's, it's a, a, a form that means one who, it's a, it's a participle, one who has been graced. That would be a literal translation. Uh, which I think is a, a phenomenal uh, insight into this whole arrangement. What made God choose Mary? You know, that's the question I ask myself. Is, is it because she had the means to raise his son, to provide for him the finest education, to give him a wide range of experiences, to travel the world, to see the way other civilizations think and live? No. No, she, as it turns out, she didn't have any of that. You know, what did she have? What did she have? D did she have some sort of like excessive religiosity where she had lived all her childhood in, 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 in a temple apartment where she was guarded by priests? Some later Christians actually made up stories about that, which is totally false for the record. Um, no, no, she wasn't, she wasn't especially ho like known for holiness in the whole town where everyone's like, oh, Wait till you meet Mary. No, I mean, she was just another person. That's how, that's how what, what makes her um, different is that God graced her. God gave her favor. God showed her grace. And this is a God of grace, the same God that we see throughout Scripture. And then he says it again, that uh, she has had grace with God. So that's what, it's God. It's not Mary, it's God. God chose her. And I, first of all, I love that he chose her. Don't get me wrong. But it's not because she was so great. It's because he is so great. And I'm sure she was 
you know, well, let, let's, let's read on. Let's read on. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob and over his kingdom. There will be no end. Um, first of all, verse 31 is fairly unremarkable. The name Jesus, it was super common in the first century. It's just sort of like Joshua. Uh, like the guy who led the children of Israel into the promised land after Moses, that, that Joshua, same, same name in, in Hebrew. We, we, uh, we distinguish the two because Jesus was such a famous Joshua that we, we, <laughs> we had kind of a, a linguistic break there. But it was a very common name, right? So saying, oh, name your kid Jesus would not have been, Mary would not have been like, yes, I get to be Jesus' mom. No, like there were lots of Jesus' moms out there in that same time. Um, and bearing a son, you know, like half the kids are sons. That's not special. But verse 32, he will be great. All right, we're starting to get excited, right? <laughs> if, God, if, if it ended there, you know, he'll call his name Jesus, he'll be great. I think she'd be a happy mom. Like God said, my son, son's going to be great. I'll take that. But he's just getting warmed up. Look, uh, and the son of the Most High. Well, that can mean a couple of different things, but it gets real clear in the next sentence. Verse 32, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. Now, this is big. This is huge. The throne of David is to be king over Israel. And so we're talking about the Messiah here. We're not talking about somebody that's special, somebody that can like, I don't know, play an instrument so well that everyone would, would gather in concert halls and listen to that person, which is great, you know, but like this is even beyond that. It's beyond like a, an expert scribe who could memorize the entire Torah and recite it to you on one leg, right? No, this is even better than that. This is, this is the guy in charge of the whole thing. This is someone like David, the son of David, and then it says in verse 33, I love how verse 33 just further unpacks everything to clarify it for us. And he will reign over the house of Jacob for 40 years. Does your version say 40 years? If so, we have some real Bibles in the back. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. It says forever, right? Who reigned for 40 years? Do you know? David. Yeah. And Solomon. And Saul. Yeah. Somebody say in the back there. Yeah. So... 40 years would be like a really epic reign for a king. 40 years. That's what David did. But this, this one is going to be better than David. I mean, this is just unbelievable. It must have been just mind-blowing to her. You have the, the Roman government has conquered Israel at this time. They're living in an occupied territory. And yet, one, one, her son is going to be on the throne of David. He's going to rule not for 40 years, but forever and I love how it just says the same thing again right afterwards, verse 33. And of his kingdom there will be no end, right? So if you, if you reign forever, your kingdom doesn't end. But you say it twice, it really gives it the emphasis. Um, so verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth... In her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing, I love this verse, for nothing will be impossible with God. So you, 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 you're familiar with this story. You, you've heard this read during December, right? Every year, probably, in some way or another, or in a dozen or so songs that you either love or hate. Um, you know, you, we hear this, this recapitulated over and over that, you know, she, she gets this message and then uh, there, there's this baby who's going to be born. He's going to be awesome. Um, and she asks the question, well, how can this be? And the answer is, look, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you and the, the, you're not going to have a human father. It's not going to be just a normal baby. And he gives, he gives, I love how the angel sort of justifies this. He gives two two points here. One is, well, look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth is old and, and barren, and she's six months pregnant. And then he just states it like as a, as, a, as a principle. Nothing is impossible with God, right? Like if God can create a universe, he can create a, a baby, right? <laughs> Baby's actually not that big of a deal compared to a universe. Uh, but anyhow, 
Then we get the moment here, right? The moment where she has to decide. Because, you know, and this is something I love about guys, that he doesn't say, and you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and you're going to do this and the other. Uh, he says to her, look, this is the plan, but she can say no. She can say no. At this point, this would be the time where she says, you know, my life isn't great, but it's not terrible. And I, I'm pretty sure this would make it terrible. She's smart enough to know that. She's smart enough to know that getting pregnant before getting married in that culture at that time would be a big deal. It would be a lifelong uh, uh, reputation that would follow her, her around, right? So this is a big deal. She's betrothed. This is going this is, this is to be like a bomb going off, her getting pregnant, right? Right? Uh, Money's changed hands. Now the families are all going to have to get involved. I mean, if she can convince J Joseph, maybe, maybe she can't. But throughout all that, she says in verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Would you look at that faith? That's real faith. You know, when you, when you uh, pray for something that's probably going to happen anyhow, that's, that's, that's nice, but like, this is, this, is, this is like, hey, here's the plan. It's going to ruin and change and make special your whole life. Are you with me? I mean, that is huge faith. That is, that is courageous and, and courage, too. Uh, we know that in... Uh, Jerusalem, many years later, when Jesus was in a, a heated dialogue with uh, some of the religious leaders in John chapter 8, that they said to Jesus, we were not born of sexual immorality. We weren't born of fornication, Jesus. So, you know, th this, this, uh, this stigma that she picked up transferred to Jesus. And to the whole, and it's not like things stick on one person in this culture. It goes to the whole family. Oh, you're related to that, Mary. Hmm. We're talking about small village gossip here. The kind, of, the kind of situation where everybody knows everything. And she says, you know what? She knows her context. She knows what she's risking here. Be it unto me. I'll do it. I'll take on the job. I'm your person. Right? I just love that. That simple faith. And uh, that, is, that is how I want to be in my life. What about you? You want to have that simple faith? It's, it's simple in the sense that it's not complicated, but it is still courageous. You know, it's not, it's not weak. It's strong, but it's simple. Verse 39, uh, it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Um, so this is, this is maybe 80 to 100 miles away. This is, I, I always pictured this when I read it, like, oh, she went like, down the street next door, rang the bell. Oh, hey, Elizabeth. No, this is 80 to 100 miles away. Mary's way up there in Nazareth in Galilee, which is way north of Jerusalem. And this is the hill, the hill country is south of Jerusalem. So this is like three to four days worth of, of journey in, uh, you know, probably by foot. Right, so this is not this is not like a little thing going to visit uh, cousin Elizabeth. It's it's a big deal, and she goes all the way down there. Why do you think she went down there? I I don't I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I think maybe it was because the angel mentioned. Oh, by the way, Elizabeth is pregnant, you know. But it doesn't really tell us, and, and we also don't know that it's, whether or not she knew that ahead of time. You know, if, if she had already found out about Elizabeth because she lived so far away, right? We don't really know. But we do know that she, she, did, she took this big journey on, and she shows up at the door, right? Verse 40, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with, exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Talk about confirmation. 
Talk about confirmation. Have you ever had an experience with God and then uh, some time passes and you, and you start to question it and you say, well, did that really happen? Did I make that up? You know, did I just connect dots together in, in, a, in a sort of creative way? Can this, or did God really, did God do that? You start to ask yourself those questions. Well, Mary has this experience, and she's pregnant, and they don't have pregnancy tests, and we don't know how far along we are. But we do know that when she showed up to Elizabeth, she got a positive pregnancy result here, right? Because she says, you're pregnant, I'm pregnant, you're pregnant, my baby knows your baby, and your baby is going to be my Lord. I mean, what, what an amazing confirmation to receive for this, this, this young woman who is really just Taking, taking God's side over against whatever else may come down her way, which, of course, we're going to see very shortly was going to be significant. All right, verse 46. And then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations shall call me blessed. And for who... For he who is mighty and has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. I absolutely love this poem here. It's called the Magnificat, uh, which is because she begins it by saying, verse 46, she magnifies the Lord. Uh, So it's traditionally given that title. But I, I love this poem because, first of all, this poem tells me that Mary is a Bible lady. She's steeped in Hebrew Scripture. She's grown up with it. She, she's, she's, she's the kind of uh, little kid that paid attention and that learned, as opposed to all the... No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, she paid attention. She learned. She wasn't, she wasn't just going through the motions at, at synagogue or, or the trips down to the temple. You know, when... I mean, you think, you think that uh, it could get boring up here when I read... What did I read there? Ten verses. I lost half of you by verse 3. Okay, like in their society, public reading of scripture was the big part. It wasn't, it wasn't all the, the preaching and they sure didn't have these big fancy screens, right? We're talking about somebody droning on, reading a Hebrew manuscript. And you know what they're reading? The part that is probably the driest of our whole Bible. They're reading Deuteronomy. They're reading Leviticus. They're reading Exodus. They're reading the, the parts that tell them how to live. The law of Moses, numbers, right? And she listens. You know how I know she listens? And she doesn't just listen to Torah, the, the law. She listens to the prophets too. Because this, uh, this, I don't know what you want to call it, a praise statement. You could call it a song maybe or a poem. This uh, statement she utters here from verses 46 to 56 or 55 has all these tie-ins to what Hannah said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, when Hannah finally got pregnant after she had had a a struggle getting pregnant for so long, and she finally got pregnant, and and Hannah produced this incredible uh, poem as well that was giving glory to God. I uh, I, I think we today, let's say like Hannah got pregnant today, you know, she struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled, and then she finally got pregnant. Uh, I think it's more likely that this this Hannah would come online on social media and say, I'm so proud of myself. Finally got pregnant. Emoji, heart-shaped, whatever, flowers, you know. And then there would be 50 comments of people with, like, gifts of of people jumping up and down, right? We are so weak compared to these people. I mean, we're going to read this just a second. I mean, look at what Hannah puts together here. I mean, it's absolutely astounding. Uh, on the, if you could read that, it's on the right side. Or if, you, if you prefer your Bible, it's 1 Samuel chapter 2. Either way, uh, I'm over here. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. 
Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. I mean, just look at how she talks about God. It's not all about, oh, God has done this for me, and God's done that for me. I mean, yeah, God's done something for her. It's a big deal. But her perspective is broader because she's a Bible lady. You know, she knows, Hannah knows the scripture that came before her, even though she's hundreds of years before Mary. Um, where was that? Here, verse 4. The, the, bow, the, bows of the, there's, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to, to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Verse 9, He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces against them. He will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his, south, of his anointed. Uh, Hannah had uttered this when she got pregnant. And so Mary, it's not like she, she, she's like, all right, hold on, let me get out my phone and pull up my Bible app. And let me just, just hold on, Elizabeth. I know you just greeted me and your baby leaped, but I, I need to put this together. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, this is good. I can work with this. No, no, it was in her soul. She was so steeped in the scriptures, in this way of this mode of thinking and talking, that when it came time for it to come out of her, it just bubbled out. And, it sat, and it's not identical. She, it's not a direct quote, but there are all these parallels. She quotes two Psalms, Mary does. And then look at, look at these tie-ins. My soul magnifies the Lord. Look at that. My heart exalts in the Lord. Again, not exactly the same, but there, there's, a, there's a real connection there, a real parallel. She talks, Mary talks about the humble estate. Hannah talks about, talk uh, no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. Uh, Mary says, holy is, holy is your name. Uh, so does Hannah, holy like the Lord. Uh, Mary says, he has shown strength with his arm. Hannah says, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Uh, she, ha Mary talks about scattering the proud. And uh, we have something very similar here. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. Uh, verse 52 says, He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. And Hannah says, The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. Uh, there's a lot of this reversal language where like, the people on top end up dropping to the bottom and the people on the bottom end up getting lifted on, on top. Um, because really both these women have these very similar experiences of being... Uh, well, Hannah, Hannah was, was a very low status, she was in a low status situation because her husband Elkanah had two wives. The other one is uh, Penina, don't name your daughter that, she was a jerk. Uh, but anyhow, <laughs> Penina made fun of Hannah constantly because Hannah couldn't have any kids. It's like, oh, what a, what a heart wound, right? And um, so Hannah is sort of like, in, in, the, in their culture, in their society, in a low status because of that. And... Now she's going to have this, this child, right? So she's being lifted up. And so she, she's picking up on that a lot. Uh, Hannah says, He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash sheep to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Do you think Mary resonated with that just a little bit? Oh, by the way, you're going to have the, the greatest human being ever. Mary's just like a random peasant girl from a podunk village. You're going to have the Messiah. Yeah, she's resonating with these different scriptures. Uh, you filled the hungry with good things, and also very similar, those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. Uh, she has helped the servant Israel, or he has helped his servant Israel, goes with, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, and uh, so on. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and uh, keep going, look at what else the Bible says about Mary. All right, so of course you know what happens. She goes home after three months. Before long, it's really hard to hide a pregnancy, right? Uh, eventually, there are physical manifestations of this. And I so wish we had the talk. Uh, I wonder what it sounded like, don't you? <laughs> Where she talks to Joseph, her betrothed, her engaged uh, fiancé, right? Uh, Matthew 1.18 
It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Well, that's like the narrative explanation. What, did, what was Joseph's perception and how did he receive this? Verse 19, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and willing, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So we know that she had the talk or he found out somehow. I don't know how that went. I mean, how does it even go? Hey, Joseph, we need to talk. You know, they find a place that's sort of like semi-private because privacy is not, their, their sense of privacy is not our sense of privacy. So there's always people. Um, and uh, she says, I don't know how she gets around to it, but she says, I'm pregnant at some point, right? And uh, he, he, he probably, if I, if I was Joseph, there's only one question I really want to know. Who did it? Yeah. <laughs> Who did it? <laughs> Who did it? That's all I want. Just, you don't have to say anything else. We're, we're, we're done. But like, just tell me one thing. Who did it? Who's the baby daddy? Right? Who the baby daddy? That's what they say it in Georgia. <laughs> Who is it? Who is it? And just, then what does she say back? What do you think she said back? God did it. <laughs> just imagine trying that today, right? Well, honey, it's a funny thing, but uh, I had this angel... That angel did it? No, no, it wasn't the angel. It wasn't the angel. The angel gave me a message because he's a messenger. He's not an impregnator. He's a messenger. And he said that the Holy Spirit would overshadow and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still a virgin. Okay. Our, uh, so who did it really? <laughs> we know he didn't believe her because it says right here in verse 19 that, you know, he's a just man, but he didn't want to put her to shame, but he was going to divorce her quietly as quietly as you can in a little town where all the parents already know what's going on. Uh, verse 20, And as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So God gives Joseph the job of naming the child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Uh, and look down in uh, verse 24. When, jo when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. What an incredible guy. So you can see how God really supports Mary, right? Right from the beginning, he gives her this incredible opportunity through the angel. He says, you know, you're going to have, you're gonna have the, the king of Israel is going to reign forever. She says, all right, sign me up. He, said, he tells her that information about Elizabeth. She goes to Elizabeth, confirmed, right? She has the talk. I don't know how that went down, but however it went down, it was going badly until Joseph, the dreamer, had a dream, and God said, that is my kid, and it is a miracle. It is a miracle, baby. And uh, Joseph says, all right. So now he, she's got the support of cousin Elizabeth, who says that the baby is, is her Lord, and then she's got the support of her, of her husband, you know, Joseph, to, you know, who would soon be her husband. So then you go through the, uh, the birth, right? You know the story. They uh, end up going down to Bethlehem. And while well, they're, they're there, she has a child. And then the, the day she has a child, these random shepherds show up. The shepherds show up and the shepherds say, we saw a vision of angels that said, this day in the city of David is born for you a Savior, Christ the Lord. And we believe that this little baby is that person. Confirmation. Confirmation, right? And then a little bit of time goes by after this. Uh, she goes to get the child circumcised on the eighth day. And then there's this cleansing ritual 33 days later. She's going to follow the, the, the rules of, of the law of Moses. She goes down to Jerusalem, which isn't that far from Bethlehem, and into the temple area. And the rule is you're supposed to bring a lamb and a pigeon, uh, but she couldn't afford that. So she, she instead brought, um, let's see, what was it? Two, yeah, two pigeons. 
two turtle doves or two pigeons. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she can take two turtle doves or two pigeons. So that's what she brings. She couldn't afford the lamb. She brought the two turtle doves and the two pigeons. And uh, she's in the, the temple area. She's doing what you're supposed to do as a mother after you have a son, 33 days after he's circumcised. And this old man, Simeon, comes up and he takes the baby into his arms and he starts praising God and he says, uh, that he had received a prophecy, Simeon had received a prophecy, that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Confirmation. And then Anna, the prophetess, who's 84 years old, she confirms it as well. She confirms it as well. And it says that she, uh, she spoke of the baby to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's go over to Mark chapter 3. And then... Sometime after that, strange men from the east appeared, and they brought these treasures, the gold and the frankincense and myrrh, right? And they, they just delivered to him, and they come in the room, and they fall on their faces, prostrate before this baby or this child, depending on how old he was, and they, they recognize him, paying respects to him as a great king. Confirmation, right? I mean, you couldn't get more confirmation, than, you know, if you tried, all of these different aspects, all this confirmation. But you know what? Time passed. Decades passed. And Mary doubted. Mary doubted. Look at this in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. This is after Jesus began his ministry. So this is, he, uh, he was around 30 when he began his ministry. All that we've been talking about was when he was a baby, right? Or a young child. Because after the thing with the, uh, the wise men from the east, he goes down to Africa to escape. And he's there for some time. And then he, then he ends up in Nazareth. Then he grows up. And then he's at around 30, he begins his ministry. Okay, so decades have passed. And now Jesus is out doing this stuff and, he, and he's casting out demons and he's with all these weirdos and there's all this huge crowd around him. And you know what? His family, they decide that he's lost his mind. He's lost his mind. Jesus needs a little help. Let's get him out of there for the sake of the family. We don't want to, you know, whatever damage has already been done, but so that there's no more damage, let's pull him out of that situation. Mark 3.20, then he went home, this is Jesus, went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Look at verse 31. So Jesus is in there, he's teaching, and it, then it says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers. And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. A little bit of family tension here, right? There's just a little bit of family tension going on. They're doubting him. We know his brothers didn't believe in him. The Gospel of John tells us that. They even like dare him at one point. Oh, you're such a tough guy. Go down to Jerusalem. See how you do in the big city. Okay, that's not exactly how it's translated, but that's, that's the gist, right? And in this, in this case, they try to pull him out. They pull him out. He's lost his mind. But you know what? Even though Mary doubted, she was there at the crucifixion, wasn't she? We read about that in John 19. Go, go take a look at that. Um, so the, the, problem, the problem with understanding the life of Mary is that there are so many gaps, right? We just went from like when she was... Uh, a, a fairly young, brand new mother to the point where uh, Jesus is now 30 years old, which obviously is going to be 30 years later, right? And then um, now to the crucifixion itself. We do know that she had uh, four other sons and at least uh, two sisters. Uh, Jesus had at least two sisters. So that means uh, in the years after all this stuff with Jesus happened, she was a mom doing mom stuff. Right? She was raising all these kids and, and trying to train them up and keep them from killing each other and uh, being jealous of the perfect child. Uh, so 
you know, I don't know what that was like, but you know, she was a mom for all the, all that time, and now these kids are are fairly grown up, and she's she's there in John nineteen twenty four. So they said to one another, "Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be." So this is talking about while Jesus is being crucified, they're they're gambling on uh, his clothes. This was to fulfill the scripture: they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Verse 25, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. That's at least three Marys right there. Just going to say that right now. Mary was a common name, just like Jesus was a common name. And she's there. She's there, which means that she had somehow come down during that week before the crucifixion. So she might have been actually traveling with the disciples. We don't know. It doesn't, doesn't tell us. We know that there were women that traveled with him, but she was there in his time of greatest need. His mother was there at the cross. All of his disciples had left him, except for uh, this one here that we're, we're about to look at, and these women. And it says, verse 25, um, or verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother, can you imagine that on the cross? <laughs> he saw his mother. And the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Uh, and Mary had a place in the early Jesus movement. You know, she had a place. Uh, it wasn't really a movement at the moment he was being crucified. That was later. But, you know, even on the cross, she was there. What, what, what does that tell you about her? That she's, that she's loyal, that she's a woman that is not easily intimidated by, what, soldiers, by danger of death, right? And that she's not going to abandon him. Really amazing. And, oh, how she must have despaired after Jesus died, right? After he was buried, she must have despaired. She was like... You know, what about, especially Mary, Jesus' mother, she must have so despaired because she had seen all of these confirmations early on. How could he be dead? He never got to reign on the throne of David forever. He didn't even get a day. You can just imagine her, her sadness in that because of, you know, how things turned out. But then when he was raised from the dead, can you imagine her joy? The joy in Mary's heart, right? And uh, so we read uh, one last scripture here, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 12. We read a little last bit about Mary at the very end here, um, about where she ended up. In the end, she was with the disciples, Mary. She was waiting for the Spirit. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So this is right after the ascension. Jesus has just left. They returned. Verse 13, And when they had entered, they went, into, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, the Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. Verse 14, all of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Don't you love that? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those who do the will of God. You know, and they're, and they're like, this guy's just lost it. But, by the, but in the end, where are they? They're, they're there. They're waiting for the Spirit. And that is, that, is, that is a legacy. That's an impact. You know? And Mary's there the whole time. You know, we don't know all the details about her life, but here are just a couple of lessons from, from her life that we can learn. First of all, have courageous faith. Don't be a wimp when it comes to your faith. You can be a wimp on other things, but don't be a wimp when it comes to your faith. Be like Mary. Become steeped in Scripture. That doesn't happen by putting a Bible under your pillow at night. It doesn't work by us. You've got to read the book. You've got to read it. And if you don't read it, listen to it. And if you don't want to listen to it, watch a YouTube video or something. I don't know. There's probably people acting it out or I don't know. There, there are some good animated ones. All right. We want to be like Mary. Praise God with your heart and your mind. You see, when she went to praise God with Elizabeth, it wasn't just like, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That's a great word. But there was depth to what she had to say. I mean, she went Old Testament 
on the whole situation, right? And, and it, was, it was deep. It wasn't, it wasn't as shallow like um, some modern Christian songs that are highly repetitive. No, Mary, she had a lot of material to work with. You know what I mean? And uh, trust God to take care of you. She did that over and over and over again. When, when, the, when the baby killers came to Bethlehem, sent by Herod, the government was about to liquidate her son. She got up. She left. She went with Joseph, and God had taken care of her. He had provided the, the money she needed, everything she needed to survive as a refugee in Africa until she could come back home. And then doubts don't disqualify you. She had doubts. You know what? It's okay. It's okay to have doubts. But deal with your doubts. Don't just let them fester until they become impossible giants. Right? Deal with your doubts. She dealt with her doubts because she was there at the crucifixion. And then last of all, don't ever give up on God. Even if they crucify your son, you don't give up on God. She didn't give up on God. Even in the end, when all seemed to be lost, she was still there. She was still there. She did not go home. She was still there. She was waiting. And then her heart was filled with joy when everything turned around. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the example of this wonderful woman. I pray that you would help us to um, live out our faith in our own time for men, for women, for mothers, for singles, for children, for all of us to be able to tap into this legacy of our heritage of people who have stood for you and that you would help us to stand for you today even when it's unpopular, even when we may suffer insult, even when we may get made fun of or bear a stigma, we ask that you give us the same courage in the name of Jesus.